this semester, Fall 2020, our theme, Confronting Old Testament Controversy. Um, and we have been confronting Old Testament controversy. Our first week with Dr. Micah Green was a broad conceptual overview of uh, issues in the Old Testament, how to confront them in a Christian context. Then we discussed the text of the Old Testament, or the Tanakh as we now call it, what, uh, consisting of the Masoretic text, the, uh, the Septuagint, the different text types, the Dead Sea Scrolls, as well as copies of the text and their transmission methods. Then we spent three weeks on the question of origins. We were discussing evolution, creation, things of that nature. We talked about how do we interpret Genesis 1 through 11. What about the scientific battlegrounds of the age of the earth, common ancestry, and the mechanisms of evolution? And then we uh, wrapped up that locus by discussing Adam and Eve and spent an entire day uh, talking about their relationship in the Bible uh, and their relationship to the genetic evidence that's out there um, and came to some interesting conclusions there. Uh, then, for the past couple of weeks, we have been focused on uh, the second locus of controversy, which is the question of Israelite origins. And so we started by discussing the historical question of the Israelites' exodus from Egypt. Then, uh, two weeks ago, we discussed the historical question of their uh, military incursion into Canaan. And then today, we're going to talk about the ethical question of what exactly was being commanded whenever the Israelites left Egypt and went into uh, Canaan. Um, so a couple of takeaways from Exodus, uh, just a quick review, real quick. I'm not, you can read these if you'd like. Um, but broadly, we just talked about how this is a very important event that permeates through all strata of the Hebrew Bible, even to the earliest text that is represented in the Old Testament, specifically the Song of the Sea in Exodus 15. And while there's no direct evidence of the Exodus, there is really good indirect evidence. Um, broadly speaking, some of the archaeological data in Egypt maps onto a lot of the general patterns that we see in Exodus, but there is no direct evidence of it. Um, and then secondly, we discussed how there is good a priori reason to take the Exodus event um, seriously as an example of testimony. Most human beings, almost all of our knowledge is mediated by testimony, um, and the Exodus is no different. Now, uh, that was what was called the Kazari principle. The guy's name is Tyron Goldschmidt. And um, in all honesty, I think he kind of overstates his case because uh, he says you can prove the Exodus. I think that's a bit much. Um, but it definitely gives you good a priori warrant so that in the absence of any obvious contradictory archaeological evidence, it's very reasonable to believe that uh, a group of Israelites did, in fact, exit from Egypt. Then we talked about the historicity of the conquest. So this was last week, and a lot of this material we'll actually cover uh, indirectly again today. But broadly, the conclusion there was that the question of Israelite origins is not a simple, a group of people left Egypt and then they came into Canaan and that's it. There are variegated stories that are, and, and traditions that are preserved in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and some of them testify to an exodus and a conquest. Some of them talk about a more, what might be considered a more infiltrative view, a more peaceful infiltration. Some could even be taken to mean that the Israelites were themselves Canaanites and then emerged or evolved into Israelites. Um, and so our conclusion there was that we shouldn't let these contradict each other. They don't need to uh, you know, elevate one above the other. We try to integrate them and recognize that the, the uh, origin of Israel is a complicated question that involved numerous socio-political, ecological factors uh, before it ultimately uh, came to be the nation um, as represented, for example, in the monarchy. But in general, what we came to a conclusion there was that uh, despite all the theories that are out there, none of them are comprehensive, but they're also not all wrong. Um, the paper by uh, Hess, for example, talks about where all the theories have their strengths and also where they have their weaknesses. So our conclusion there was just, you know, take, if it works, you know, take what works from each one and try to integrate them all together. And in sum, what we concluded was that there was indeed an exodus from Egypt, a group of Israelites that left and came into the land, wherein they had numerous military skirmishes that were communicated by the genre of an ancient conquest account. And then following that, uh, there were Canaanite factions that aligned with the Israelites, and then there were Israelites that aligned with the Canaanites as well. And that's where we got our mixed population that uh, shows up in the archaeological data as well as in some of the biblical data as well. So that was just a brief summary of where we've been. But now we turn to the next question, which is a more ethical question. 
um, which is, did God command genocide? So here's the story of two guys in the Bible that instantly have the same Hebrew name. So the man that we know is Jesus once said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And you have heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. But his namesake, Joshua, who was the leader of these uh, military incursions, is related as Joshua struck down the whole land, the hill country, the Negev, and the lowland, and the slopes, and all their kings. He left no one remaining but devoted to destruction all that breathed, just as the Lord God of Israel commanded. And this has undoubtedly been the source of great consternation for uh, many believers in the Bible. So um, let's see if we can progress past kind of a general unease into a specific argument. Now, I'm not going to read all these premises up here for you, but um, if you want to read the full argument, in 2009, the publication Philosophia Christi had a symposium where they had about five articles going back and forth on this question of, did God command genocide? This was one of the uh, critics who said, yes, God did. And his conclusion here is that God is morally perfect, and so since he's morally perfect, he would never command one nation to exterminate the people of another nation nation, unless he had a good reason to, but since he didn't have a good reason to, um, then there's no way God could issue those commands, but the Old Testament text says he did, so that means that the Old Testament is wrong. This is a Christian, so that's his argument. He says, God exists morally perfect, there's an immoral command, that means that there's something wrong with the Old Testament. Another guy, Randall Rouser, makes a similar argument, this is also a Christian. He says, God is the most perfect being there can be, Yahweh is God. Yahweh ordered the people to commit genocide, but since this is always a moral atrocity, that means that uh, a perfect being would never command genocide, so Yahweh never, commended, uh, never commanded genocide. Ipso facto, either God doesn't exist, or the text is wrong. But in no circumstance did God command genocide. So we've actually answered our question. Our question tonight is, did God command genocide? The answer is no, <laughs> Right? But you might answer that no by saying, ah, the Old Testament is wrong, or you might answer it no as in God doesn't exist. So that's not really comforting answers, is it? Um, here's an atheist version that I think is uh, a little bit sharper. Um, basically, he is kind of making the same point that, you know, uh, God is the author of the Bible, but the Bible uh, has things in there that command things that are morally insensible, um, and this is bad. Now, I don't think that this guy actually concludes God doesn't exist from that, but this is just his version. So the point being that there are a couple of people that have formulated this into very specific arguments, but they all pretty much center around this idea that God commanded genocide, God can't command genocide, therefore either Bible wrong or God doesn't exist. So um, with that in mind, uh, let's talk about a couple of general comments, a few commitments, and some of the assumptions that uh, at least I'm going to be making in, in this discussion. Because um, like I said, you can defeat this argument easily. Oh, well, the Old Testament's wrong. Some people might not want to go that route. Um, so the first thing is, is, on, is just an intellectually honest comment here. Divine violence is not limited to the conquest account. But today, we're only going to talk about this one account in the Bible. There are numerous accounts where God is involved in some type of violence or appears to command violence. And I say that only because the responses that we'll be discussing today don't necessarily transfer from this historically contingent circumstance of the conquest over to some other event. A common example is Elisha calling 42 bears to kill a bunch of uh, boys. That's a very different circumstance. Um, so that's just intellectual honesty uh, there. The second one is that we're going to disagree with Rouser and Morstan uh, that Scripture is, they, and, and we're going to assert against them that all of Scripture is divinely inspired and that it is inerrant. We're going to keep with those assumptions. Now, in all honesty, if uh, there are good, faithful Christians who deny inerrancy, um, and if inerrancy is what, uh, and some deny inerrancy over this issue, they just cannot swallow that the God of Jesus would command anything so morally abhorrent, or what they perceive to be morally abhorrent. Um, so I just say that in honesty, that, you know, that is one way out. You deny inerrancy, and then you can do that. Uh, that's not the tack that I'm going to take. Um, but that is a tack that can be taken. The third thing is that we're going to agree with Morriston and Rouser and other Christians that Jesus is the purest and clearest revelation of God. 
This is stated most clearly in one of my favorite uh, New Testament books, the book of Hebrews. Long ago and at many times in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things and through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Another uh, example would be whenever um, Philip inquired of Jesus, show us the Father, and Jesus' response is, have you been with me so long that you do not realize? He who has seen me has seen the Father. And I think it's important that that bear weight, that the Old Testament is not Jesus, and Jesus is the purest revelation of God. And then the last thing is a more sort of, I don't know, personal or maybe emotional type thing, is that it's perfectly fine to not know what to do with these passages, and it's okay to not like these passages. I can tell you straightforwardly that I don't know, and I don't think anybody really has a complete, solid, airtight answer to this question. And frankly, I don't really like these passages. It would be a lot easier for everybody if they just weren't there, uh, quite frankly. Um, in fact, more so than that, I think that the biblical authors themselves struggle with this question. In fact, if you read the book of Chronicles, you'll notice the Conquest account does not make an appearance in the book of Chronicles, which is ostensibly a summary of the history of Israel. Um, and more so than that, there are characters in the Bible who protest against God and question his actions. So not only is it okay to not like things that are in the Bible, but the Bible gives language that you can use to protest those things that you don't like, which I find oddly comforting in a way. Um, so a quick review of inspiration and inerrancy. So inspiration, um, as described by R.C. Sproul and Ligonier and those guys, is um, God used human authors, uh, God worked through the human authors uh, to produce the Bible, and that the text is truly the work of those human authors. It is just as much a work of human hands as it is of God. And likewise, inerrancy, by that outworking, we affirm that God, in his work of inspiration, utilized the distinctive personalities and literary styles of the writers whom he had chosen and prepared. So I, just as a praises of coming event, the people that wrote the Bible are not 21st century Americans. They are not the same people. They're, they're, they do not have the same sensibilities that we do. Um, and they wrote the Bible in a way that, frankly, if God had chosen me to write the Bible, I'd write it in a very different way. But he didn't, and I think we have to respect that. Um, if we're going to go with this assumption. Um, and then the last point uh, to reiterate more on the not liking things in the Bible is, of course, that Job is a paradigm example of this, that a man in the Bible who suffered things, a righteous man that suffered things he did not understand, and clearly there is no clear justification for what happened to Job. But the answer that the Bible gives is not very friendly, um, but ultimately models what I think is the best approach whenever dealing with things that are uncertain um, and, frankly, kind of unpleasant. So as we go into this, um, a one more caveat, which is this is the first time that our chapter here at A&M has really tried to address this question in any depth. Um, so uh, just for transparency, I personally think that this is probably one of the rougher presentations, so I just ask you to be a little patient uh, if, if things aren't quite as tight and polished as they usually are. Not that they are anyway, but anyway. Um, so some recommendations. These are some folks that are way smarter than me uh, and have thought about this a lot more than I have. So Trimper Longman uh, wrote Confronting Old Testament Controversies. That is an excellent book, and it gives you a spectrum of views that he interacts with. Uh, and even to give you even more cards on my table, I actually agree with Longman uh, very closely. Like uh, His theology and my theology are like really tight. Um, Another view that is a little bit more, I don't want to say left or right, but uh, less standard conservative evangelical would be Greg Boyd. Uh, he is, if you were to make a circle of all the acceptable views within conservative evangelicalism, Greg would be like right at the edge, like literally the, the final point before you go off into weird stuff. Um, and so he has a book called Cross Vision uh, where he... Uh, employs this view of the cross, uh, and specifically a hermeneutic called the cruciform hermeneutic. Uh, and then he basically addresses the, the question of divine violence uh, from the point of view of, well, God is incarnate in Jesus, so what does this have to say about the Old Testament? And the reason this book is unique is he does not give up on what he calls infallibility, which is like a really watered-down version of inerrancy. Pretty much anybody that's in Greg Boyd's camp 
um, that uh, goes down that sort of cruciform hermeneutic, basically looking at the Old Testament through Christ, they ultimately end up denying inerrancy. Uh, so Greg is kind of like your last stop before you go uh, in, into that area. And then the last uh, guy I'd recommend, of course, is Paul Copan, standard evangelical conservative here. Uh, and his book is uh, Did God Really Command Genocide, which is the title of today. All right. So the last one, too, is the core of tonight's meeting is going to be from this article by this guy, Eric Siebert. He wrote an article called Recent Research on Divine Violence in the Old Testament, which I also recommend. Um, and he surveyed uh, these views. It's going to be a lot all at once. Don't get scared. Uh, 14 different views on how Christians interact with uh, the question of divine violence. And he's grouped them kind of into seven broader ca uh, categories. The first being defending God's violent behavior, which is basically like trying to find justifications for it. You can see all the subgroups there. Second one is balancing God's violent behavior, which essentially says, yeah, the Bible describes God as violent, but it also says he's merciful and loving, so we have to take both of those together. The third is critiquing God's violent behavior, um, where we engage in a more critical uh, response to uh, God's behavior. Uh, the fourth uh, and fifth ones, accepting and rejecting, that's basically saying, yeah, some of it's God, some of it's not. The fifth one, reinterpreting God's violent behavior symbolically. This is uh, following in the tradition of the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church, for example. Uh, Oregon was well known for saying all this violence is purely allegorical. And the last two are protesting God's violent behavior, which is just being mad about it. And the seventh is celebrating God's violent behavior, which sounds sadistic until you uh, read what they have to say. And I think that celebrating God's violent behavior is actually kind of interesting. The argument is, since we know God takes justice seriously and will use violence to uh, destroy evil, we don't have to. And we have the freedom to be nonviolent because God has taken the metaphorical sword away from us and will wield it himself. So the reason I summarize these really quickly is we're only going to talk about these. Um, and I've kind of, uh, the gray ones we've kind of already talked about a little bit, but um, these other ones I've kind of grouped and rearranged myself uh, into four other views that we're going to talk about. Um, but this is just basically where I'm getting this from, so you are aware. Now, Siebert makes the argument that the first five all interact with each other and kind of rely on each other. Uh, but the rest of them kind of contradict each other. I think Siebert is wrong about that. Because the more that I read about these people uh, that have these different views... I am more and more convinced that everybody has at least one little piece of the puzzle in, in their hands. So I am going to do two things. I'm first going to just expose you to these views and say these are some of the views that are out there. And then I'm also going to make an argument for you that you don't have to pick one. They, they all interact with each other. Um, in fact, I think you'll need all of them to have a coherent answer. So the ones that I've got grouped together is first, it's not as bad as it seems or NAB for short. And then the second one is like it. God has good reasons. Now, these two are going to overlap quite a bit. Um, and th this one-two step is really what your conventional, standard conservative evangelical response is going to be. It's, it's not genocide. It is violent, but God had good reasons for it. Um, and we're actually going to spend the majority of our time on this side. Now, the other two are closer to like the Greg Boyd flavor of response which is first that God accommodates his revelation, that the picture we get of God is not the purest, clearest picture of God, and then secondly is that Jesus changes everything. Um, and I'll actually go ahead and tell you right up front, the orange and the red side, the not as bad and the God has his reasons crew, one thing that I personally find very unnerving is that they never refer to Jesus in their argument. Like they will say that Jesus is there, but they don't actually say that Jesus changes anything about how this account should, should be. In other words, I think the entirety of their arguments could be taken by Jewish people, for example, and it wouldn't make a difference. So the, part of the reason I am highly motivated to include some of these voices like Boyd's um, is because they take seriously that the gospel has some bearing on this question in a way that I don't think is fully appreciated in the other two groups. I say that up front because whenever I get to it, you might be bored, I don't know, but I wanted to get that out there. So, um, any questions? Let me pause right now if there are any questions or comments before we jump headlong into to all of this. Any? Anything? <laughs> 
Whoops, what did I do there? Okay. If not, we'll just get right on with it. I seem to have unmuted. Okay. All right, so let's talk about this first one. Um, and I'll be transparent. This is where we're going to spend the majority of our time. Because I actually think this view does most of the factual heavy lifting when it comes to this question. So the first thing is, um, when we talk about what is not as bad as it seems, we have to talk about three things. What actually happened on the ground, what was supposed to have happened, and what could have happened. Those are the three things. So the first is, what actually happened is not as bad as it seems. And this is basically what we've already talked about uh, for the past couple of, uh, uh, for the past week or so. So as Joshua says, that passage I quoted at the very beginning, Joshua defeated the whole land. He left no one remaining, but utterly destroyed all that breathed. But we also have, in these same passages, uh, Joshua and the Israelites inflicted a very great slaughter on the town until they were wiped out, and when the survivors had fled to the fortified cities, all the people returned safe. So we have this back-to-back -back contradiction, almost. Were they destroyed entirely, or were there survivors? Yes. Um, likewise, Joshua made a war, made war for a long time. And the way that we uh, essentially answer this question is by going back to the genre analysis. And what we have here in Joshua 10 and 11 in particular, and the book of Joshua as a whole, is an ancient conquest account. So that's uh, indicated by repetitive language, and he took this town and put them to the edge of the sword. Then he took this town and put them to the edge of the sword. Particularly the language of annihilation, which is what we have uh, been focused on. A lot of hyperbole. If you read these uh, stories, you would think that every Israelite went to every battle and made it back without a single casualty. The common narrative structure between these wars, even though the, the uh, northern campaign and the southern campaign were radically different, they were still structured the same. And then lastly, there was a unique focus on Joshua as the human military leader. So this is an ancient conquest account, is the genre that we are talking about. Um, to reiterate on the annihilation language, uh, the Merneptah Stele points out that, you know, it claims Israel is laid waste, his seed is not, 200 years before the, uh, the Israelite monarchy. So clearly that's not true. Another one is the Papyrus Harris, where uh, Ramses III says that he destroyed the Weshesh of the sea and made them non-existent, immediately followed up by, I made them slaves and settled them uh, in my strongholds. So again, this annihilation language followed up by, actually, there were survivors. So what we have here is um, not what actually happened in this conquest is not a complete scorched earth, every single living thing destroyed across the entire uh, face of Canaan. That is not what happened. Nobody thinks that's what happens. The Bible doesn't claim it. The archaeology definitely doesn't back it up. So summarizing Kitchen, uh, Kenneth Kitchen here, he says, the narratives of Joshua describe an entry from Jordan, a full destruction of only two cities, then defeat of local kings and raids throughout South Canaan. Towns are attacked, they're taken, they're damaged, kings and subjects are killed. There is violence, let's not forget that. But the cities are then left behind. Same in the northern campaign, Hatsor is the only uh, city that is completely destroyed. And so these preliminary raids, or disabling raids, um, were celebrated with war rhetoric appropriate to the time. In other words, they were related in an ancient conquest account. So if you just read the account literally and straightforward in its, quote, plain meaning, if you remember that discussion from a long time ago, you're not going to get the true meaning of the text. So what actually happened? Was there actually a genocide? No. Was there actually a, a, an a annihilation of every living thing across the land? No, there was not. But, objection, a failed genocide is still an attempted genocide, right? So we're not out of the woods, right? So here's how the conversation goes. Our initial objection is the Israelites committed genocide on the indigenous Canaanites at God's command. Therefore, we either have an erroneous Old Testament, because that garbage never happened, or God doesn't exist. And the Israelites were being led by a, a faulty neuron in Joshua's brain. Our response is, no, the indigenous Canaanites were not annihilated. That's the whole point of the book of Judges. But the small-scale uh, military raids were described in the, in the terms of annihilation, according to the genre convention of an ancient conquest account. Okay, so that's some progress, right? Objection. Okay, fine. The Israelites certainly didn't commit genocide. Like you point out, the archaeology and uh, the biblical data say that. But they were supposed to commit a genocide because God commanded a genocide. 
And isn't that the point of Judges? That they failed in genocide? So that's the next part. Which, if you're going to buy into the, it's not the NAB view, it's not as bad as it seems, the next part is, well, no, actually, what was supposed to happen is not as bad as it seems. So let's look at these commands in greater detail. So Deuteronomy 7 is the primary locus of, of this command. Uh, this is from uh, ostensibly from Moses. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, the seven nations more numerous and mighty than you, and when the Lord your God gives them over to you, you shall defeat them. Then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them, show them no mercy. You shall not intermarry with them. Deuteronomy 7 and following. Deuteronomy 20, likewise. In the cities of these people that the Lord your God is giving to you, you shall save alive nothing that breathes, but devote them to complete destruction, um, that they may not teach you to do according to all their abominable practices that they have done for their gods, and so that you sin against the Lord your God. So again, this, this is that language that we're talking about. This is not pretty. And if you read that um, at face value, that is definitely terrifying. So this is what the debate really comes down to. It's, it's all about this term, the Hebrew term, harem. And I'm just going to be frank with you. There are tons and tons of arguments going back and forth over what this word means, what it doesn't mean, things of that nature. But whenever it says you must devote them to complete destruction, the Hebrew there is put them under the harem, or sometimes this is just referred to as harem warfare. Now, the first thing to note is that um, in, Deuteron in the command itself, Deuteronomy 7, it says, you shall destroy them completely, and then follows it up with, you, will not, you shall not intermarry with them. Now, the command itself is already showing this same pattern we've seen numerous times of annihilation followed by some survivors. How can you intermarry a group that you have completely annihilated? That seems kind of odd. Um, and so then likewise, as we've already mentioned with uh, Joshua 10 and 11, is that Joshua did indeed wipe them out, but left survivors. In fact, we have here exactly that Joshua left no one remaining, but utterly destroyed all that breathed as the Lord God commanded. So we actually have, just from these two verses here, we have a nice little negative argument. So, premise one, God commanded Joshua to conduct harem warfare on the uh, residents of Canaan. Premise two, According to Joshua 10, Joshua succeeded at fulfilling the Haram command. Premise 3, Joshua did not complete an ethnic annihilation of the indigenous Canaanites. In other words, a genocide, because they were survivors. Therefore, God did not command genocide. It's pretty straightforward. If God commanded genocide, and Joshua completed the command, or sorry, if God commanded genocide, and then uh, Joshua did not, commit, uh, did not finish the genocide, then... How did he complete his command? Now, this is not, this doesn't get you very far. This just gets us to our initial inference, which is, we've now answered the question, did God command genocide? Clearly not. Otherwise, Joshua would have failed. So, thoughts? It's a little too easy, right? We're only like 10 minutes in, or I don't know, 20 minutes in. They give for the definition of harem because he contradicts it in Deuteronomy 7 by saying, men, you shouldn't intermarry. So well, it doesn't seem to mean that. Yeah, it, like I said, there's a huge debate over this question. And I've got to be frank, this is just the purest of like technical victories. Like we have won on a definitional uh, uh, point. Congrats, right? But it does, it, I think it is important. Words do have meaning. Um, genocide does have a meaning. And whatever harem is, in this context, it is not a genocide. Um, there are other reasons for that. You can get into the very technical definition of how genocide is defined according to the, um, uh, I think it's NATO or, no, the UN, sorry. Uh, you can get into, like, all of those details. I think that's kind of irrelevant because we, we have on here, whatever Joshua did, he succeeded. Sure, go ahead. There's one important thing to know about Haram. So looking at two other ancient Near Eastern texts, one is the Meshka stone or the Methuselah, and it's a, it's a Moabite text about a Moabite king putting the Israelites to a Haram. And mm -hmm. so he also claims to like, devote them all to destruction, yada, yada, yada. But then Israel is like still there. 
Yeah. So I took her to show you to do that. So that's not what her rent is. And also her rent has a it has a has a like a like visual dimension because Joshua's harem is about is about giving all this land to Yahweh because Yahweh is kind of like taking a president in Israel. And then in the Moabite text, um, King Misha he is dedicating Israelite land to his god Hamosh. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that that's exactly right. There's a uh, uh, I've editorially left a lot. That's good information. Um, I editorially left that out uh, just because there it, the like you mentioned the. Once you start getting down into these texts and debating what is and isn't haram, it is such a, a nebulous thing. And whatever it is, it it uh, it definitely gets paired up with this annihilation language that doesn't ever get uh, or doesn't seem to ever actually happen. Um, so I think yeah, I think that's a very good point. Any other comments? Okay. So this is. Um, uh, yeah, so this is just kind of our first opening move, right? So we've we've successfully said, no, not a genocide. Violent, scary, sure, but not a genocide. And, and as you mentioned, excellent points there that the debate over harem is way more complicated than that. Um, but we've at least got, it's not a genocide. Do you have a comment, Sam? Uh, I'm not sure if this is going to turn into a question, but it's a bit of a comment. It might turn into a question. Um, <laughs> My, what I'm kind of taking away from you at this point is that if these texts aren't describing a literal annihilation or a literal genocide, um, but they still correspond to things that actually happened and values that the Israelite people either held or were supposed to hold. Um, and it seems to me like uh, if, there, if there's some kind of homogeneity within the Israelite culture that is the priority when it comes to annihilation language, as in you're destroying every element uh, left behind in this land um, that you are now taking over. And I think that falls in line with the value of homogeneity when it comes to, like, uh, the primary concern is idolatry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that didn't end up turning into a question, <laughs> but... Uh, that's fine. Well, I, I think the at least the sentiment of your question or comment seems to be like this may not fit. It may not be genocide, the textbook definition of genocide, but it definitely is close enough for us to be unnerved by it is kind of the direction I was going. Uh, or that, that's where I got from it. Okay. Okay, so what isn't haram? So we know, at least from this, if, we, if this argument is successful, if we take the biblical texts to be infallible and inerrant, as we're, or inspired and inerrant, then we at least have a good opening move. We've successfully neutralized the, the genocide question. But um, this follows up to another question, which is, isn't, this, isn't that whole thing about Joshua and the subsequent uh, failures of the Israelites, um, didn't they fail at Haram? Uh, so maybe, there was, maybe Joshua was like the opening salvo, but weren't the Israelites supposed to complete the rest of the annihilation? And so this is where a closer, uh, 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 a closer reading is required to answer this question, how did the Israelites really fail? What did they fail at? And Judges 1 sets the stage for what they did by outlining in great detail how they failed. And there's a common theme. Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shan. Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites in Gezer. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. Not did not destroy or annihilate, but did not drive out. And so this is where we're getting into this idea of driving out from the land. This is the primary purpose. This is not annihilation. If not annihilation, what is the purpose? It's driving out of the land. So as it says in Exodus 23, God says, I will send my terror ahead of you, throw into confusion every nation that you encounter. Um, I will send the hornet ahead of you to drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, etc. But I will not drive them out in a single year. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. I will establish your borders from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea, and I will give into your hands the people who live in the land, and you will drive them out before you. Likewise, in Deuteronomy 7, remember, that's the chapter that the uh, Haram command is. The Lord says, the Lord your God will clear away these nations before you little by little. You will not be able to make a quick end of them, otherwise the wild animals uh, will become too numerous for you. So again, the purpose here is not killing them, and it's definitely not hunting them down once they've run away. 
it's driving them out of this particular land that is explicitly defined in the Exodus 23 passage. One thing that I do not have in here is there are explicit provisions on, what, on how to conduct warfare outside of these boundaries as well. And in no case is the Haram ever given. The Haram order is explicitly limited to this region of land. Okay? So in summary, uh, there are a lot more passages I could go through, but broadly speaking, when we, talk, when we look at the uh, descriptions of what the Israelites were supposed to do to the residents of Canaan, there are two broad categories of orders. Dispossession and destruction. Uh, dispossession is words such as they ran away, they migrated, they were cast out, they were driven out, etc. Destruction would be, of course, they were you know, killed, you know, set on fire. Jericho, for example. Um, and uh, the purpose here that we have is also outlined in Deuteronomy 12. The Lord your God will cut off before you the nations that you are about to invade and dispossess. And, dispossess. and when you have driven them out and settled in their land, and after they have been destroyed before you, be careful not to be ensnared by inquiring about their gods, saying, how do these nations serve their gods? We will do the same. So in summary, what we have, if you care, okay, this is like totally the word study trap from several weeks ago, but I thought this was funny. If you do just a word count, you find out that dispossession language outnumbers the destruction language by a ratio of three to one. Does that mean anything? No, it really shouldn't. But if it, it comes up a lot, so I thought that was an interesting stat. Uh, they just run away. Yeah, they just they just run away. I mean, if I I don't know. Maybe um, I I don't know. It it seems to be the the implication is that, for example, with the case of Jericho. Um, they march around the city. They declare, we are here on account of our God, Yahweh. The walls supernaturally fall down. At that point, that, like, if you, don't, if, if you stay and fight at that point, that's really kind of on you. Um, you should probably run away uh, at that point. That's how I seem to, that seems to be the conventional interpretation. Okay. Um, I thought I had one other thing here. What was it? Oh, the, oh right. And so the, the other thing, too, is um, this question about, like, what is God doing to drive out the Canaanites and the Hittites and everything? I have an ancillary comment on this. So, this line here, I will drive them out, uh, I shall send my hornet ahead of you. This is a really fun argument, if you want to get down that rabbit hole of exegetical weirdness. Uh, nobody really knows exactly what it means. Maybe it's a literal hornet, that's a minority view. Uh, others think it's a metaphor for just the terror of God and things of that nature. Um, there is one interpretation that I want to throw out because I am partially sympathetic to it. Um, there is, if you recall from our archaeological discussion about the Exodus, there are two dates for the Exodus, early and late date. And the late date is basically about 1270-ish uh, BC, uh, at the beginning of the Iron Age. Now, um, you'll recall that one of the discussions from the archaeology is, during the 13th century, most of Canaan, or at least a lot of the cities that the Israelites ostensibly went to inhabit were kind of unoccupied or sparsely occupied. There are some interpreters that have uh, suggested that the collapse, the uh, collapse of the Bronze Age, led to massive evacuation and migration of all the people in the uh, uh, in the region of Canaan. Um, in particular, the Egyptian army kind of left, and then it was overrun by bandits. A lot of people ran away into the hills. It just became entirely unstable, and not a lot of people were able to live in that land. So if you're a late dater, some have suggested that this God going before his people and driving out the majority of the land could, in fact, be correlated with this collapse, uh, late Bronze Age collapse. The number of sites that were constructed in uh, Canaan drastically reduced. There were the particular site that was excavated by Israel Finkelstein noticed something had dropped from like 230 sites to like 15 sites over the course of a couple of centuries, um, indicating a major drop in population. So some have suggested the majority of the Canaanites that were being dispossessed of their land were gone centuries before the Israelites even made it on, made it out of Egypt and into the land. I just suggest that because I thought it was interesting. In, but anyway, in passing. Okay, so in summary... The, what actually happened was not a genocide. What was commanded was not a genocide. It was a dispossession. And then lastly, what could have happened is not as bad as it seems. And um, 
So this is a summary here that I have from uh, Lawson Younger, who uh, wrote the book on the ancient conquest accounts. And so his def- this is, uh, like I said, there are various definitions of harem. This is his definition. He says the harem was not designed by God to eliminate the Canaanite culture per se, but to eliminate the Canaanite religious influence. The Israelite harem commandments had close links to the issues of idolatry and breaking of the second commandment. Um, in other words, the harem was not concerned with the eradication of Canaanite uh, clothing, fashions, pottery styles, music, diet, and other types of particular cultural preferences. But it was deeply concerned with the eradication of Canaanite religion. It's gods, idols, altars, rituals, etc., um, and so on. And um, in, in a lot of ways, these religious practices were tied to a lot of the moral offenses that the Canaanites were cited for. Yes, you got a comment? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for, for sure. So that, that's Lawson uh, Younger's argument. And this has an interesting corollary to it, which is, consider this. If the harem is about driving people from the land, but specifically people who have false religious influences and even horrible religious influences, then it seems like there's another way to avoid the harem. I mean, obviously you can get killed or you can run away, but what if you just change your religious alliance and follow the God of the Hebrews. So, uh, to quote Copan, um, he's going to get, he's going to kind of bleed over into our next locus, uh, the next view, um, but I think that this is relevant. The Canaanites are not in general portrayed as innocent. They are trespassing on land belonging to Israel and have engaged in practices such as human sacrifice for centuries without repentance. Human sacrifice, of course, being tied to their religious uh, practices as well. The uh, dominance that they had in the land meant that Israel could not live alongside them without getting absorbed into the culture. Yet, um, without being absorbed into a culture engaging in abhorrent practices, or more restricted with loss and younger, the religious practices. But the text suggests that Canaanites who turned from those practices could, in fact, be spared. Um, or, to use, since loss and younger says it's more restricted on the religious practices, people that changed their religious alliance from the false gods to the true God could, in fact, be spared from, from the ban. You had a comment? So you're emphasizing how a lot of these different uh, rationales could complement one another, but there is a little bit of a tension here where um, a number of Canaanites have been driven out of the land by God ahead of time by some hornets of some kind, mm-hmm. but Bronze Age collapse. But there <laughs> yeah. also have to be enough of them left yep. in a civilization of some kind mm-hmm. to where it poses a legitimate threat. Yeah, yeah, and, and the explanation in the text is the wild animals explanation. Because if they if everybody leaves, then wild animals take over. Yeah, that that that's part of where that is. So um, yeah, so th- this is suggesting that conversion to Yahweh was certainly possible, um, which is why the sudden section of what could have happened. So we're going to get a little speculative and talk about some other possibilities. But there are examples of explicit examples in Scripture of people who avoided the harem by conversion to the true God. Rahab, of course, the quintessential example, for, again from um, uh, the book of Hebrews. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. She lay, and, of course, in the narrative uh, itself, she spares the spies. She says that we know that your God has given the land to us, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and uh, they spare her and then let her live with them in the land. So it's not like they spare her and let her run away. It's like they spare her and then incorporate her into the Israelite community. Another example, Caleb the Kenizzite. Remember, the Kenizzites were explicitly said, be destroyed in Deuteronomy 7. What does it say in Numbers? Because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went into. Again, a different spirit, follow the Lord wholeheartedly. And potentially, this is an interesting one, the entire city of Shechem could uh, potentially have left, a la Nineveh in the book of Jonah, have left the Canaanite, or their, left their indigenous uh, practices and turn to uh, Yahweh. So quoting here, all of Israel with their elders and officers and their judges were standing on both sides of the ark and the stranger as well as the native. So commentary, this is from Copan's book, 
At Shechem, those who heard the law being read included not only the assembly of Israel, but also the strangers who were living among them. Implication, they come into this city, and a lot of people, or at least corporately, they, they join the Israelites. Uriah the Hittite, of course, shows up in David uh, during David's time. Uh, a faithful man uh, followed Yahweh, but a Hittite nonetheless. And one of the judges, Shamgar ben Anat as well, um, Anat being one of the Canaanite gods uh, of, of that region, turned away from following presumably Anat and into, yeah, into that. So in summary, what, what do we have so far on this whole thing? So first, the harem is not about eradicate, or sorry, it is. The harem declaration is about eradicating the Canaanite identity from the land, not necessarily destroying the persons themselves entirely. So if the persons are killed, or if they flee, or if they convert, the haram will have been successful. And the one point that I haven't been making yet is Canaanite's not an ethnic term. There are seven nations that are in this group, which, if you want to get super technical, uh, if you're targeting seven ethnically, radically different groups, that's not really a genocide. I mean, it's, it would have to be a super genocide. or I mean, <laughs> but, but the point being that because it is a mixed multitude that they're targeting, it's not on the basis of their ethnicity that they're being targeted. Um, secondly, the cities that are outside of that land are not to be destroyed. So if the Canaanites literally all migrated five miles outside the boundaries, they would be safe from the harem. So it's not about uh, them as persons being destroyed. Um, and then as mentioned, there are some suggestions of non-military action to aid with this uh, event. So the land is described as vomiting out its inhabitants. Some interpreters have taken that to mean that God turned the land to be uh, unfruitful. That's perhaps why they evacuated the, and went uh, up into the highlands. God says, I will drive them out, I'll send my hornet, things of that nature. And then lastly, what we just said is that because the harem is focused on religious practice primarily, conversion to Yahweh provided salvation from the harem. So, in sum, no, harem is not genocide. But that doesn't mean that it's a good thing. It's Siebert and, uh, sorry, not Siebert, Morriston, Morriston, Rouser, um, those guys, they're not objecting that we've won some technical victory on this term genocide. What they're objecting to is that God's engaging in violence at all. Um, so if God's doing that without a good reason, that's going to be problematic. Uh, so that's going to be the next section that we turn to, which is the reasons that God had. Um, but before we do that, uh, are there any questions on this locus of uh, it's not as bad as it seems? Yes. One area which seems difficult to conclusively rule out is the death of children and infants. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, this one is perhaps the the hardest one. So, um, I think we'll actually get into some red flags at the at the end of this section. Because one thing I didn't mention is that a lot of these explanations kind of stretch things a little too far and potentially screw things up. So if you're in the NAB camp, the it's not as bad as it seems camp, uh, such as Paul Copan, this is like, he's like the figurehead for this group. One of the things that he does is he really stretches, and I mean he goes as hard as he can stretching the limits of interpretation to the um, point of saying that these military incursions were exclusively military incursions. Like all the combat was military and there wasn't anything other than that. Um, I don't know that that can be justified, although I do think that, broadly speaking, the situation in Canaan is very similar to the situation of like Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If you look at the justification that Truman and those guys were looking for whenever they were dropping the atomic bombs um, in Japan, is that they had to find they found cities with the highest proportion of military occupation, knowing for a fact it was entirely unavoidable that uh, many people, innocent civilians, would be killed in that process by practical reality. So as much as I would like to think that Copan is right, that they're only engaging with um, uh, military people, I, I don't think we can get around this question that uh, whenever these cities are destroyed, that children and you know, pregnant mothers and whatnot are being destroyed along with them. Now, one thing I do think Copan is right is that that's not, it's so, oh man, I hate saying this. You have to view it as collateral damage, almost the same way that um, you would view something like an attack on Nagasaki or something like that. 
once you have given into the reality that there's going to be war in the land, um, you kind of can't get away that there are going to be innocents killed. And that's really kind of the, the problem with war in the first place. All wars are evil. This war ultimately is fundamentally no different. It's no less pleasant than any other war. Uh, and, and unfortunately, I don't think there's a good answer to that. Yep? It doesn't get rid of it, but if you take Rahab's uh, information she gives us about the feeling of what the people knew about mm -hmm. what was going to happen, or, or the impending yeah. uh, army or whatever, then if you thought that the that the fam that the men were um, merciful towards their families, they would mm -hmm. send their families right. away from you know. So I'm not saying that that happened. I'm saying, but it could it, like it could have been. Right. So it could have be the fact. It could be the fact that not as many women and children were around because they had fled, been driven out because their husbands wanted them to go to safety or whatever. If it was true that all of the people absolutely felt or knew that it was in, uh, in mm -hmm. coming. Yeah, I think I think this is also closer. I think this is a closer to a, a good answer than the uh, some of the other views, because um, well, I mentioned I didn't mention one important thing. That command: kill women, children, everything that breathes. What that fits within the annihilation language um, thing. To the point where there's liter you really cannot tell if that's supposed to be literal or not. And I tend to think it's not literal. I think it's a very stock expression. Just invade and do not stop invading this city once you, once you attack it. Now, to, to your point, to pair it with the original comment that we talked about. Uh, so Kitchen's summary of the military activities are raids by these Israelites. They go, they raid a city, they attack it, then they return back to Gilgal. Um, presumably, they've executed the king, military officials, they've had a resounding military victory, why would you stay in the city any longer? Presumably you would flee at this point, uh, flee or convert, uh, or, or something to that effect. I would like to think that's the case, and since we're in the section titled, uh, what could have happened is not as bad, I'm willing to say for speculation purposes that that's fine. So I think the, the three-layer response to the women and children is just to say, the language, there's... There's so much interpretive ambiguity that you cannot really be certain in taking it literally. Uh, secondly is that these are primarily military targets, um, and so there's good reason to think most of them escaped. Um, there are, and again, to get outside of that, there are other passages that are much more problematic, like in Numbers 31 with the Midianites. Unfortunately, we have to scope it to just this question, so um, that's what I've got there. Any other comments on this so far? No? Okay. Okay, so what we're left with is definitely not pleasant, uh, but it's definitely not a genocide. We've lowered the bar. So the question here is, did God have a good reason to command this in the first place? Um, and I'm actually going to go through these next sections a lot faster than I went through that first section. Like I said, I think the first section bears the most weight in the explanation. So this is a gentleman, Clay Jones. Uh, he's like board of directors of Russia Christie or something, so he's like important. Um, from an organizational perspective, legally required to say that. But um, so he, he actually was uh, a contributor in that Philosophia Christi um, uh, symposium that I mentioned, and his argument basically is: Look, guys, the Canaanites were rough. If you're, you know, you are you're crying crocodile tears over uh, these hypothetical Canaanites that were just living in the land, you, you don't understand how terrible it was. And so he his thing focuses on Deuteronomy nine where God says explicitly, not because of your righteousness or uprightness of your heart are you going into this land, but because of the wickedness of these nations uh, that the Lord your God is driving out before you, and that he may confirm the word that the Lord swore to your fathers. So essentially, it's a twofold thing. God made a promise, and you guys are not righteous at all. You suck. But, you, but these people are due for judgment. Um, and they've been due for judgment for a long time. And so Jones, in his article, goes through frankly, disturbing detail of some of the practices that were going on. The three big ones, idolatry, as has been mentioned, um, child sacrifice to a god named Molech, just disgusting, and then, of course, sexual deviancy, incest, adultery, and bestiality. And as has been mentioned, these three things were all tied in with their religious expression. So the, and I don't want to go in any more detail other than 
is pretty gross and nasty. So the fact that these people were in the land doing these terrible, terrible things, at least in Jones' argument, that they were absolutely justified in, God was justified in enacting judgment uh, on them. Um, and to elaborate a little bit more on the promise to Abraham here, God in Genesis 15 has this famous passage, as for you, uh, because Abraham's friends lived in this area, and he says, and God says to Abraham, as for you, you will go to your fathers in peace and be buried in a good old age, and, they, and your children shall come here, this land that I've given you, in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And the standard interpretation of this, and there are many, but the standard one is that in an act of mercy, God allowed Abraham's uh, friends in Canaan to continue being blessed by the land for centuries until eventually the ripeness of their judgment wa was due. And I think that this is a, such a perplexing picture where God in his mercy actually caused his own children to suffer uh, under Egyptian rule for a while. And it's such an odd, odd picture, I think. Um, and so in summary here, uh, in Leviticus 18, uh, this is another law that's here, uh, the justification is don't do, there's a long list of don't do all these things. They're primarily sexual sins. And God says specifically, don't do these because this is, um, for by all of these things, the nations I'm driving out before you have become unclean, and the land has become unclean so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But, it says here at the bottom, if you do these things, the land will vomit you out when you make it unclean, as it vomited out the nations that were before you. So in summary, the Canaanites had defiled the land uh, with great religious and sexual sin, such that their judgment was to be cast out of the land. Again, they hadn't lost their lives or right to life or anything. They had, God exercised judgment and says, this region of land, you've lost your privileges to it. And those that remained in the land after the collapse of the Bronze Age or the Hornet or whatever you want to interpret there, anyone that remained was to be driven out and anyone that remained was to be destroyed. And that the Israelites were also subject to that exact same punishment. Um, so if you read the prophets, it is just a constant drumbeat of the horrors that the Israelites committed, even sacrificing their children as well. And for that, they were led into exile, and ten of the tribes were literally lost forever because of that. Um, yes, you have a comment, Sam? Uh, the, uh, the accusations levied against the Canaanites, is that data primarily biblical or ah. theological, or is there a mix? So this is a great question. Um, I'm actually going to get to it a little bit more in the red flag section because the one of the problems is this practice of describing horrible things to your enemy was also a thing that other ancient Near Eastern cultures did to uh, justify some of their military actions. Um, and so some have said, even evangelicals, so John Walton in particular, he has a book called The Lost World of the Israelite Conquest, where he actually goes to the far other extreme, and he says the Canaanites were morally identical to the Israelites. And it was purely God exercising imminent domain over the Canaanite strip. Um, and so uh, that would be someone reacting in the opposite direction, saying that this language of the evils that they have committed is also not literal. It's sort of all under this broad umbrella of warfare rhetoric, uh, and so part of that is demonizing your enemies. I mean, my God, we're in the middle of an election right now, and how many times have you heard the other side is going to eat your baby and make you a communist and inject bleach in your bloodstream or who knows what else, right? It, ancient Israelites weren't that different, and the ancient peoples weren't that different. Um, now, to your question about the actual data that is verified, uh, Jones's article, you can read the thing right here, his, uh, he, he gives extra-biblical data, in fact, quotes directly from some of the religious texts used by the indigenous Canaanites. And some of it is so bad, he said in the footnotes, I have to leave this out, and I had to pray about whether to even put the citation here because of how horrible it is. Um, he did put it there, and I read it, and I wish he hadn't. Uh, and primarily, it is about the incredibly graphic descriptions of ritual sex with animals, is particularly how the, the rough one. I mean, I honestly, after reading it if, it, if it had any bearing in reality. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, now, uh, in honesty, I think Jones... Oh, you, you had a comment? Go ahead. Well, so, like, um, part of that imagery within ancient Eastern texts is, like, sex is connected to 
speakers are already full. And so like people would like do these things and it's sort of sympathetic magic to also bring fertility onto the land. And it's interesting because um, the dimensions like Og's bed given in Deuteronomy mm -hmm. correspond to the dimension of the sacred marriage bed of um, Marduk in the in the temple in Babylon. Mm -hmm. And that was a ritual sex um, like like thing. And so they are propagating like Babylonian basically like like magic in like Canaan. And so like this is the reason why that, you know Yahweh targeting this stuff. Because yeah. like they're actually like channeling this like spiritual evil and also God's own like enemies in his divine council. Mm -hmm. So like there is a lot of context here that like modern people just they just won't be able to like see it mm -hmm. and kind of like have that like revolt. Oh, absolutely. I'm glad you brought the Divine Council plug. Sam will be doing the, a Divine Council topic in two weeks. Um, so we'll definitely uh, get into that. But absolutely. You know, earlier when we talked about how, oh, it's their religious practices that got them cast out of the land. If you weren't aware of just how depraved and horrible it was, yeah, you'd definitely think it was probably an over-the-top um, thing. But yeah, pre appreciate it. Sam. Okay. So the last point that I want to make on this is I think one thing that may be helpful and has definitely been helpful for me in paralleling and kind of in, in trying to understand and keep track of all of these, were they being annihilated, were they being destroyed, what's a Canaanite identity, what's a religious practice, things of that nature. Um, I found a lot of interesting parallels to the process of uh, denazification following World War II. Uh, so I have an example up here. Um, following World War II, yeah, it's satisfying, isn't it? So following World War II, there was a very similar problem faced by the Allies and Western powers broadly, which is we have this identity called a Nazi, which should never, ever be allowed on our planet ever again. So how do you destroy Nazism? Well, you could destroy all the Nazis, right? That could work, but that's not practical and probably inhumane. Um, and likewise, the Canaanite harem. You have these horrible, horrible practices that should be eradicated from the land. How do you do that? And there are some interesting parallels. So as we've discussed, individual Canaanites were in fact killed primarily in a military context. Likewise, Nazis were killed in a primarily military context. Some of them executed uh, capitally following judicial uh, processes, such as the Nuremberg trials. A lot of Canaanites were physically driven out of the land you know, you can no longer have any right to this area. Likewise, Nazis were driven out in, of, the Fuhrer, or of the fatherland and into places like Argentina, where they had to hide because they, you know, nowhere else would accept them. Canaanite iconography was destroyed. So as we mentioned in Deuteronomy, this is how you deal with them. You tear down their Asherah poles, you tear down their bales, uh, things of that nature. Um, and likewise, Nazi statues, memorials, flags, etc., burned, swastikas destroyed. In 1954, the German government reissued uh, I don't remember how many millions of medals to uh, German uh, soldiers uh, because the medals that had been issued under the Nazi regime all had the swastika. And so there was a massive reissuing campaign to try and eradicate the swastika. In fact, nowadays, I think if you show a swastika in Germany, you like get arrested or something. It's, you know, it's still banned. And then likewise, we have Canaanites who converted uh, from you know, their practices into you know, the Israelites. So Rahab would be an example. And likewise, we, there are some Nazis who changed their tune. Um, Werner von Braun is a really popular example that comes up quite a lot. And as a side side note here, uh, Rahab and von Braun equally have very controversial pasts and controversies following their conversions. So um, I think the parallels actually go a lot deeper than, than you would think. So I have an illustration. This is a destruction at Hot Sword. This is a, a religious um, statue that was destroyed. And this, of course, is the swastika uh, being destroyed. Um, I also think, too, that the parallels go even deeper because there were a lot of terrible things that happened during the denazification process. You ever read about the liberation of Berlin, for example? Uh, when the Soviets got there, it was not, it, it, it was not a pretty thing at all. Um, and I think that it also bespeaks to even whenever you have this noble cause of trying to eradicate Nazism from the planet, uh, you can read about a lot of the mistakes, overstatements, oversights, um, and things that were done during that process. Uh, and I think that there are a lot of parallels that you can see about just what are the practical necessities of war, things of that nature. So I don't know if that's helpful for you. Obviously, with all the analogies, they break down eventually, but I found that to be somewhat helpful for me.
Now, what are some dangers? Okay, dangers. First, like I've mentioned, uh, Copan in particular is guilty of this. You can, if you try to go all in on the it's not as bad uh, approach, you're going to try and minimize the things in the text so that they fit with this 21st century, you know, ethical understanding of the world. And that causes you, if you're fully committed, to make a lot of hermeneutical leaps that are just not there. Um, and so that's a red flag. You've got to watch out if you're being guided by the text or if you're being, gu being guided by something outside the text. Um, to reiterate, even and the entire enterprise of trying to justify the conquest so that it fits with our 21st century way of thinking about things actually reinforces the idea that the Old Testament is supposed to be a moral handbook with 21st century ideals in it. That's not what it is. That's not the purpose of it. Um, and if you buy into that, you're going to miss the point of the Old Testament and have to make arguments that you shouldn't need to make in the first place. Uh, the other thing, too, is that if you overemphasize the evil of the Israelites and the evil of the Canaanites, you can unintentionally justify any violent action. Uh, I actually listened to an interview recently, an excellent interview. It was between a classic, too. It was 50 years old. It was between uh, William F. Buckley and Noam Chomsky. It was a great interview. Highly recommend it. And one of the things that Chomsky was criticized for was uh, the observation that um, he, he was basically saying everyone is evil, uh, and Buckley was saying, doesn't that justify everything? Because if everyone is a sinner, no one's a sinner, and we can do any military action, and it's justified, right? Um, I thought that was really funny, because that's exactly what I was thinking about people like Clay Jones, that they typically make the pivot from, oh, aren't these Canaanites so evil too? But you're also evil too. Total depravity, original sin, things of that nature. The real question is, why doesn't God kill you? And I thought, now, if you're using that to justify your argument, if I get killed by a drone strike, then potentially that was an act of God, right? Like, there's no, what's the moral recourse in that situation if I'm a sinner? Uh, obviously, they don't actually make this argument, but that's a danger if you take that too far, uh, and you could potentially justify just about anything. So, to reiterate a little bit more, like we said, the Haram Declaration is primarily about removing the Canaanite identity out of the land. There's non-military action and military action and conversion. As said numerous times, this is not a genocide. The inhabitants were dreadfully evil, particularly spiritually evil, um, and that was manifested in their physical acts. And so in an act of, God, uh, act of judgment, God revoked their privilege to the land to fulfill his promise to Abraham many generations ago. But this still leaves us with a question. So wh why are these violent depictions in the Bible in the first place, and why are they celebrated as being violent? Why is Yahweh a man of war? That's unnerving. So now we, we transition more to, I guess, the sort of, um, you know, the Randall Rouser, uh, Greg Boyd type of view, and talk more about the nature of revelation and inspiration. So now, if you remember, we talked about how inspiration uh, means the Bible is a human work in, in as much as it is a divine work. And now we're going to lean into that to understand why these pictures of the Bible, or sorry, pictures of God are in the Bible in the first place. Then the title starts to give it away. God accommodates his revelation. So let me start with a question. Are there any false depictions of God in the Bible? This is an open-ended question. No. I hear a no. Two no. I hear another no. Okay. You are wrong. Okay, are there false depictions of God in the Bible? I'm going to make everyone mad. This is going to be great. God, an incorporeal spirit, correct? He has a corporeal body in Genesis 2, walking around the cool of the day. What about God, who is all-knowing, asking Abraham, telling Abraham, oh, now I know what you're going to do. Or what about God, who is outside of time, being depicted as changing his mind about things, or changing it all? In fact... What about all the doctrines of classical theism, all of you Thomas that are in here? Isn't God described as changing, being angry, uh, doing things that contradict what Thomas Aquinas said? Yeah, that's what I thought. So yes, there are false depictions of God in the Bible. So what, what the thing is, okay, so I say that because everybody will agree in principle 
that there are passages in the Bible that are not true about God, that they are accommodations. Or um, the distinction that I found that I find helpful is um, the actual God who exists beyond comprehension, beyond space and time, beyond all that stuff, and the textual God, the God depicted in the words of the Bible. You can recall from our uh, discussion on Adam and Eve where we talked about truth simplicator and truth in a story. There's a very fine parallel. Case in point, does God get angry? Well, if you're a classical theist, no. God is God. God doesn't change. He doesn't become angry. He cannot be influenced to become angry. Does God get angry in the Bible? Yes, many times, all the time. Probably like 90% of the time he's mad at somebody about something. So in that way, we have to distinguish when these depictions are accommodating so we can understand them. If God tried to communicate to us in a way that was purely factual, it would literally be on comprehension. That's actually a part of God, is that he is incomprehensible, at least in classical uh, theism. Now, there's a very interesting parallel, because there are people who think God is inside of time, and God does change, and God does get emotional about things. And so the debate between like the classical theists and the theistic personalism uh, personalist is, are these texts literal or are they accommodations? Very, I think it's a very apropos parallel. Um, that is a debate I will not get into now because I've already made Andrew and all of our Thomas here mad, so let's just move on. So the, so the thing here is, God, where, wherever you fall in this, God progressively reveals himself to his people. Here's a great quote. I forgot to get the citation right from someone named 1987. Uh, so this lady said that uh, the people of Israel found themselves in a culture in the ancient Near East that accepted holy war as the way to deal with national enemies. And God did not tell them to stop going to war any more than he said stop speaking Hebrew. And so just as God uh, will assume divine uh, temporality or, or not a temporality for a minute to make this point. So just as God is depicted as being in time or depicted as being passable so that he can be understood by people that are created to be temporal and passable, he is depicted to be violent and violent-minded because the violent-minded people are the ones writing the book. Makes pretty good sense to me, I think. Um, how can some creature who has had an experience with God uh, relate that experience in any comprehensible way without having to accommodate it to some type of understanding? So the language of God being passable, for example, is accommodationist. Likewise, the language of God being violent is accommodationist. This is the argument that uh, proponents of this view will, will make. And so we can look at this as, you know, we have these limited military skirmishes in Canaan, but God didn't choose people like you and me to do these military skirmishes or to write about them. He chose ancient people that speak in very, you know, uh, with great rhetorical flourish. And then, of course, they credit God uh, the victory in these battles because that's how they glorify God. Um, I think an interesting parallel to this might be uh, people today who would thank God for things that, you know, us sophisticated theologians would say God didn't have anything to do with that. Um, if someone finds a parking spot, oh, thank God I found a parking spot. Now, I mean, is that really God finding a parking spot? Pro probably not. But that is how people in our culture uh, ascribe glory to God. And so people that have these military skirmishes in Canaan, that's how they ascribe glory to God. And I think that we just need to respect that, even if we're not necessarily agreeing with it or comforted by it. So that's it, right? Real quick. God's depicted as violent because violent people depict him. Um, but this leads with a question now. Can we really know what God is like? Because where does this end? Like, if, if, we, if we can sort of hand wave around these violent depictions, oh, because they were violent people, can we actually know what God is really like? And I'm sure you know that the answer is yes, because of um, the Incarnation. So, uh, this last section is Jesus changes everything, which is that we cannot forget that God himself became incarnate uh, and took on flesh and walked among us um, and spoke to people and told us exactly the way of the Father, um, even going so far as to go against some of the writings in the Old Testament. Like we said already, you've heard it said uh, to love your neighbor but hate your enemy, but I say love your enemy. Um, you have heard it said, um, oh, I lost that word that one way. Oh, you've heard it said an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, for example. But I tell you this. So in many ways, God, Jesus exercises his authority over the Old Testament. So if Jesus exercises his authority over the Old Testament, why shouldn't our interpretation of Jesus 
exercise authority over our interpretation of the Old Testament. Now, looming, as all of you that have uh, any amount of church history know, is the scepter of Marcion. I said specter of Marcion. Eh, it works either way. <laughs> the, the ghost of Marcion. So Marcion of Sinope is this fellow over here. Uh, around 100 AD, um, he got really, really agitated by the differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, the God of Jesus and the God of Moses, uh, in particular the violence, but also he did not like the fact that uh, the Old Testament was written by Jews. He really did not like the fact that Jesus was a Jew. He was very upset by this. So his solution was the God of Jesus is not the God of the Jews, plain and simple. The God of the Old Testament is he's a creative demiurge. He's just a spiritual being that uh, he's just a spiritual construction worker. He built the world, but that doesn't mean that we need to listen to anything he has to say. Whereas the God of Jesus, the Father of Jesus, that is the true God. That is the true God who has come to reveal himself. So that leaves you with a question. What do you do with uh, your 75% of the Bible that is the Old Testament? Well, Marcion just said, yeah, don't need it. Rejected it, literally said outright, this isn't, it's not canon, and just rejected that. But what do you do with all the, old, the New Testament that quotes the Old Testament? Like, what happens then? And he says, oh, we don't need Matthew. That's too Jewish, too Jewy for me. Them. Uh, the, the Jews wrote Matthew. Uh, the Jews wrote Mark. And uh, the uh, Jews wrote John as well. So we can't have that in there either. So that just literally, literally leaves you with Luke. But Luke opens up with the genealogy. And it's filled with Jews. So Marcion said, well, chop that out. Um, we can't have that. So he chops, he, so basically he amalgamates the book of Luke, and then he takes 10 of Paul's letters, because some of them got too Jewy for him, so he left those out too. All because he didn't like the fact that uh, the God of the Old Testament was different, or he perceived him to be different. So the question is, and, and so you hear this all the time in this debate, how do we talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament without succumbing to the errors of Marcion, to the point where we just chop off the Old Testament and just have our New Testament, or to unhitch the Old Testament um, from the New Testament and let it sail off into the distance? Um, so uh, one example of this, uh, so, so we, this is what we need to avoid, right? So one example of how to approach this question of divine violence from the perspective of Jesus is um, Greg Boyd's uh, approach. And like I said, Greg Boyd is basically the last stop before you get into like wild stuff. Um, and essentially his argument goes like this. Whenever we look at God, because this is the question, how do we know what the true God is like? Uh, Boyd says the true God is revealed in Jesus. But more so than that, the true God is revealed in Jesus on the cross. So he calls it a cruciform interpretation. The purest revelation of God is in Jesus, and the purest revelation of Jesus is on the cross. So anything that does not conform to this view of God as pure, self-giving, uh, humility all the way unto death uh, view of God, that is not uh, a correct interpretation. And so what he argues is that the Old Testament is a literary crucifix. In other words, when we look at the cross, it's an ugly, disgusting sight. Like, let's, let's not forget this. There was, there was a man who was, like, horribly beaten, dying on a cross. Horrible death. And yet it's the center point of the Christian faith. Um, and it is something that is, is, is venerated and something that is, uh, you know, it's, it, it is a very center part. But it's horrible. It's hideous. There's, and yet we call it something beautiful. And so Boyd says it's the same thing. We look at these passages. Joshua, leave alive nothing that breathes. There's nothing pretty about that. But if we're committed to that same interpretation of looking past the ugly into the beauty that's behind it, we can see what's ultimately going on. And Boyd's argument is that God is allowing his people to misunderstand him, which I don't find very convincing, frankly. But he essentially says that God is allowing he is bearing the sin of his people by accepting their horrible views of him and letting it stay in the text so that he can stay in relationship with them. Now, is that true? I don't know. Um, but he ultimately argues that uh, Jesus as the purest revelation is there. So what do, you, what do you think of that view? Did I explain that well? Do I have any questions on that? Yeah, que <coughs> question? Uh, as far as Jesus... Um... That, that certainly, I think, is 
uh, progress. Like, I think slavery is an example where using Jesus, it feels like we move forward in time, and, and we have a better example, a better, a better material to work with. Um, but there is one behavior of Jesus that is really concerning to me. Uh, it's just very unsafe to run around with a sword in your mouth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's actually a very good point. So what do we do? Yeah, so we have this cruciform Christ that we can look back through time and see this you know, horrible uh, 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 warfare language in the back. But Jesus, in the book of Revelation, is ascribed violence. And he's ascribed as having a sword from his mouth. He's described as uh, riding in a horse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and he's uh, riding a horse uh, in streets filled with blood up to the uh, uh, horse's bridle. So what does Boyd do with that? Oh, God was bearing the sin of John the Revelator to depict God or to depict Jesus in that way. Which at that point, I think you're stretching things too far. If the revelation of Jesus Christ to John is not a true or pure revelation of Jesus to John, then I think that's problematic. So Boyd is partially correct here. He's absolutely correct that the purest revelation of God is in Christ. And one thing that he's also correct about is that the rules of war have changed. As many people know, Ephesians 6 says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and things of that nature. Um, and so he is correct in saying that the cross is powerful in that we no longer need to go to this warfare. We no longer have to worry about uh, having to eradicate these you know, Canaanites and things of that nature because the kingdom of heaven is um, not of this earth. As Jesus says in John 6, sorry, I thought I had it on here, uh, my kingdom is not of this earth. If it were, my soldiers would be fighting for me. And so a true partisan of the kingdom of heaven has no reason to fight on earth anymore, which I think is a very encouraging thought. And so we now loop all the way back around to a question that we didn't ask, which is, did God command genocide? No. Did God command violence? Absolutely. Will God command violence again? No. And I think that's essentially the, the, the core point here. Those who are in Christ Jesus have no need of a sword. So what are some of the dangers of this progressive revelation and Jesus approaches? Yeah, dangers of Jesus approach. Should probably pick a better phrase. So the first thing is that um, I only mentioned Boyd's view. Uh, frankly, if I had more time, I would have gone through some of the other guys. Uh, but they do drive a wedge between the Testaments. In fact, they start driving wedges between Old Testament and New Testament, New Testament books as well, much like what Marcion did. Uh, but here, it's the divisional line is on violence. Is Jesus violent in the temple? Well, that was Matthew exaggerating things. Is Jesus violent in Revelation? Well, that was John kind of looking at things the wrong way. And there's not really a consistent hermeneutic. It's just we have this picture of Jesus on the cross, and we now look at things through all that. Um, but how, how do you have various portraits of Jesus? You know, you're, you're interpreting all of Jesus through one particular view. The second thing that doesn't get brought up is that the New Testament writers never really saw a big tension between these things. Um, so I don't really know exactly what the New Testament authors were thinking about this, uh, but they didn't seem to have a problem with having uh, Joshua and uh, Matthew, you know, the Beatitudes, being in the same collection of works. So the tensions that Boyd and these others point out doesn't seem to be shared by the New Testament. Um, and then, as mentioned, selective portraits of Jesus can drive a wedge between Jesus and himself. So why do we interpret things through the lens of Jesus on the cross and not Jesus in the temple or Jesus on uh, uh, praying in the Garden of Gethsemane? You know, we can't just pick a snapshot of Jesus and exercise uh, authority over all the other ones. As mentioned, the Jesus on the cross and Jesus of Revelation are fairly different. And the last point, I think, is actually way more poignant, which is, these alleged, because uh, remember, the argument that Boyd is making is that the inspiration of the text is allowing the human author to depict God in a way that is very violent, because that's the way God bears his sin, or bears the sin of the people. He allows them to speak in this way. But that's a basically the same mechanism in play in the New Testament as well. So what's stopping God from allowing the New Testament authors to bear the weight of or bear the sin of their uh, descriptions of him. In other words, in trying to solve this problem of how do we know what the true God is like, oh, it's Jesus, in, in the way of answering that question, they ultimately say, actually, we don't know anything in the New Testament either. It could all potentially be uh, you know, faulty through the lens of that. 
Yeah, it's 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 very inconsistent. I think. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. So um, so those are some of the red flags for these approaches. All right. So now to wrap up, let's bring this all together. So all four of our views here. Not as bad as it seems. God has some good reasons. God accommodates his revelation, and Jesus changes everything. So I have a nice summary here. I'm going to introduce a new term for you. Uh, so the conquest account is a hagiographic hyperbolic account of a justified expulsion of evil Canaanites from the land of Canaan. The story is related via unnerving depictions of God as a warrior by an ancient warlike people. With the advent of the incarnation in Jesus, the violent portraits of God are cast in a different light through the revelation of his son and the future of the people of God are no longer tied to earth. And for that reason, we have no reason to take up the sword and no reason to kill our fellow man. So that's kind of, I think that's a reasonable um, synthesis of all of these uh, different views. So, are there any comments or questions or clarifications or objections? I will take them all. Yes? We were zeroing in on the Canaanite conquest um, is this the big question mark and, and the other instances of divine violence kind of fall into similar veins or are there any unique questions we have to oh. completely bypass? Um, for sure. Yeah, so for example, one assumption that we're making in all of this is um, we talk about how the Israelites, uh, or we talked about the violence that God uh, brought on the Canaanites via the Israelites. But we didn't discuss any of the violence that God brings on his own people. Um, and, that, and some people may not like that. Um, and some people may really think that the Israelites never actually deserved any punishment from God ever, and that God could never act violently uh, in those ways. Um, and I think that the circumstances of like the exile, for example, the destruction of the temple, those are situations that I think a lot of these questions are a little bit different. Um, for sure. I also think there are other weird, violent depictions that uh, have nothing to do with warfare at all. Um, so I already mentioned the, there's uh, um, um, Elisha, for example, uh, was insulted by 40, 42, 42 young guys, and uh, his response was to uh, call out some she bears, and the she bears went and mauled all of these uh, all of these young men. Um, that's an example where you don't have a just war. Um, you don't really have any accommodation of revelation, I don't think. Um, it's really hard to see what Jesus has to do with that as well. Um, and I don't think that it's an ancient conquest account, so I don't think you can say that it's not as bad as it seems. It really does seem like Elisha uh, had 42 bears, or sorry, two bear, was it two bears or 42 bears? It was two bears to killing 42 people. <laughs> 42 bears killing two people, that'd be funny. Uh, so in that case, so let me give you like a, a sample real quick. Um, the uh, prophets of God and judges of God, uh, and Moses as well, were often given authority, or they were given power by God to enact their will, um, but often misused that. That's actually a core point in, with Moses. Why did Moses not see the promised land? Because he disobeyed God. Now, he performed a miracle in the midst of that disobedience, uh, he smacked a rock and water came forth. Um, so in that case, you could say God was active, but it uh, was still disobedience. So likewise, in this story, a standard response is, this was not God sending those bears. This was Elisha, who had been given power by God to summon bears, who just summoned bears because he wanted to do that. Um, and essentially, it was Elisha acting out of his own will and saying, you know, you can justify it, say, oh, you know, 42 guys beating up a prophet, that's bad. Um, they were insulting him in a way that was uh, significant because he, uh, it, it was a way that undermined his authority as a prophet, things of that nature. But ultimately, the root of it was this was just Elisha with bears, and, and, and it wasn't God sending bears. Uh, another parallel example would be Elijah. He called down fire from God um, at, the, at Mount Carmel, uh, and then followed that up by a massive slaughter of prophets. Um, that's an example, too, where it's hard to tell, was that really God's plan to kill everybody, or was it supposed to be just the fire thing, and Elijah kind of ran with it? It's hard, it's hard, it's hard to see. But you'd have to insert another piece of defense 
i.e. the heavy metal defense, because it was pretty metal. <laughs> I mean, kind of, but... But in any event, yeah, so the, the, the broad, I mean, the, that whole broad response is just God sometimes gives uh, people power and authority that they then misuse. This is, you know, Samson, another case as well. Um, Samson, Elijah, Moses all have very clear examples. Any other uh, comments, questions? Yes. I think the one kind of embarrassing. So one thing that people miss is that whenever, whenever all the young men they are, they aren't like, like little children, they're like, they're like grown people. Mm-hmm. Like, they like tell Elijah to go up, and there is a pagan cult of sight in Iran. And so, what they're doing is they are soliciting the prophet of Yahweh to go up to a pagan site, and then they're all kind of mocking him about it. And so, mm-hmm. and so like, Elijah's like, response isn't, isn't a religious context, isn't, isn't just, oh, I'm just like mad at these people, let me just like send some bears after them. Mm-hmm. They are like, they're promoting paganism. Oh yeah, and so like uh, a lot of those like that's one thing that I, I that I have a bone to pick about a lot of these commentators is that a lot of them don't seem to actually take the like sin as like seriously mm-hmm. as like Joshua or like or, like as a lot of these people do like that, like other than Clay Jones, <laughs> do I? Other than Clay Jones, of course. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, but um, but yeah, and so that's why it's like it just it just shows us. That like God's attitude towards these things is not our kind of like milk toast response of this like of kind of like having to just like put God in this box and saying you know God God is like isn't allowed to be violent mm-hmm. and I think that people like their methodology is flawed to like to like try and kind of stand over God and tell Him well you can't do that God and it's kind of like well then who are we to kind of like tell God what He can do and so if there's anybody that God is going to deputize with these powers or, or, or with these commands it's going to be people who take sin um, more seriously rather than less seriously. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Which you still have to answer the question why these people and not these why these sinners and not these sinners and also why these people who are presumably innocent but I think you're right that it is uh, something you don't have to know either. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah, and you you do good to point out in many of these cases the situations, even if they're not necessarily warfare situations, do typically have some weird, spooky, religious thing that's going on in the background. Anybody else? Well, and one one interesting thing is. So much revolved around trying to com- combat or preserve uh, worship to Yahweh mm-hmm. and so that people wouldn't fall into idolatry. Mm-hmm. And so that after all of this exile and so forth, um, they actually didn't, didn't go back to idolatry again. Mm-hmm. Isn't that true? Oh, you're, you're talking about the after they returned back? Oh. I mean, we have all this problem in the in the land, and then they're they're driven out mm-hmm. in exile and come back. And I, I I think it's right that they 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 didn't then after that fall um, into idolatry. Well, may, maybe not the specific uh, Canaanite idolatry, uh, but the um, oh yeah, I mean you know G- Jesus certainly had some some problems with them. All right, well, um, I think that's good to wrap up. It's, I mean, it's uh, 9, uh, almost 9.15 now. Um, so I appreciate your time, and, you know, frankly, this, this is one of those issues that I, you know, is, it's pretty difficult, um, and, I, and I hope that we've uh, gotten at least some valuable information out there. Uh, of course, our Connect uh, slides are up here, so, you know, check out the YouTubes and the podcasts and all that good stuff. Um, and then I think I mentioned all those resources, but I'd highly recommend the paper by Siebert. Um, Eric Siebert is his name, um, and uh, he covers a, a, a variety of different uh, perspectives. So this is my last time talking to all of you for uh, Russia Christie, so I'd like to thank you for enduring my voice for, I think, six or seven weeks on all this. Um, we, I had a lot of fun putting together these presentations. Not this particular one. This one was not fun. Uh, but, but the other ones I did. So I really do appreciate your time.
Howdy, thanks for watching this video from Rashia Christie at Texas A&M. Be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so